Well, good morning. This morning, as we talked about last few weeks, we have Creation Ministries here with us, and this is Dr. Um, I'll get his name right. Uh, it's uh, Sarfati. Is that close enough? Sarfati. And he is with, uh, like I said, Creation Ministries International. We had Creation Ministries here about seven years ago. Dr. Carter spoke, and we really, uh, as an elder board, felt like it was even more urgent to have Creation Ministries back with us because um, just the way the world is headed right now, you know, assumptions that were true when those of us were, uh, who are, you know, in our 40s or 50s and above, you know, most people believed in some sort of creative and God and, and just some foundations, but those have all been totally dismissed now in our culture. And so we thought it was really important to have Creation Ministries back. And uh, Dr. Uh, Saf- uh, say it again for me. Sofferty, yes. Uh, he's written so many books, and at the end we'll get a chance to go by the book table and pick up some of those books, some great children's books on dinosaurs. And so we look forward to hearing more about him. So give him a warm Bainbridge, Georgia welcome. I actually slowed us down a bit too. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I've had very good help um, <clears throat> from people, helped me set up and run book tables and things. So I appreciate all the good stuff you've done for me so far. Now, I guess I should tell you where I'm I, what, what my background is. I am a real scientist who believes the Bible because you'll be taught in the government schools there aren't any real scientists who believe the Bible. They all believe in evolution. Well, I'm certainly one who believes in the Bible from the very first chapter, okay? Now, I used to shine lasers onto selenium ring molecules published in secular scientific journals in my own specialist field. So, yeah, I'm a real scientist. A lot of us around, in fact, Creation Ministries has offices around the world, about seven offices around the world, and we hire more um, PhD scientists than any other Christian ministry to our knowledge. I guess by now you know I'm not from this country as well, right? (laughs) So I better give you a geography lesson. This is my birthplace here, this country here. Um, I also lived in this country. My parents still live in this country, New Zealand, okay. Uh, In 2010, I moved over here. So I've actually got three passports now. I've got three citizenships. Uh, And the one reason we moved here is because we have two granddaughters who live in Florida, and we thought it was much easier to drive a few hundred miles and fly 9,000 miles across the ocean. Uh, Now, another thing, I'm also a retired chess master. I used to play from memory. Sometimes I played like this. I'm here. These guys are here. I'm not seeing what they're doing. This guy is telling me what they're doing, and I'm telling him what to move for me because every square has a letter and number. This was actually at a creation conference in Australia. I played with some strong people in my time. Now, another thing, I'm also ethnically Jewish. My name is the Hebrew word for Frenchman, so I can tell Jewish jokes and French jokes and get away with it. (laughs) Now, one reason, why would I believe a Jew like me believed in Jesus or Yeshua to give his Hebrew name? Well, for one reason, he fulfilled many prophecies in his first coming, and a lot of those prophecies have an expiration date on them, so only he could have done them. This is one of the books on the book table we have. And we have these books out there because we are trying to equip the church and the home. And we realize that people don't remember everything they hear. And also, I can only cover so much in a morning service. This is just to go to dig deeper and to share it with anyone who wasn't here. Now, a lot of my time is spent dealing with this man because you could call him the patron saint of the religion of the government schools. I know the ACLU brag about getting rid of religion out of the schools. Well, no, they got rid of Christianity, but replaced it with this counterfeit religion that you can call evolutionary humanism, which says that everything made itself. We're rearranged pond scum. There's no God who made us and therefore has the right to make the rules for us. And because he loves us, he makes the rules for our good. Nowadays, uh, you can make your own rules or decide whether you're a boy or a girl, regardless of what you were born as. That's what they're doing. The thing is, as you saw in the video, about two in every three people from church homes actually leave the, the church when they, when, they, when they get to college out of their parents' homes. The thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. In fact, we did a survey of students at various univers- at a university in Georgia to see what was going on. These are people who had been brought up in the church. I'll just show you what some extracts from that. To creation or evolution, which do you believe? 
Um, I'd probably have to say evolution. Evolution? Uh, evolution. Did you have any organization in that kind of helped you understand that biblical creation might be scientifically viable? No. I'm a Christian and I believe that uh, there's a God who created this universe. Did your church leaders, student leaders, did they bring in any creation teaching that showed you there was scientific evidence to support the Bible's account of creation? Uh, yes. Do you still go to church now? Yes, sir. I believe in the creation six days. You're not convinced by the evolutionary arguments in your biology classes? No. Being able to discuss creation openly at church uh, has helped strengthen you in that area, prepare you uh, for what you've learned here at college about evolution? Yes. So we found it makes a difference if kids are taught how to defend the faith uh, at the church and in the home, they have a much better chance of actually uh, answering the evolutionary propaganda they're going to get at the universities and even at the, at the school level and, of course, Hollywood. Now, one way you can find out is our free website. I'll be taking notes about this. Our free website is creation.com. hope you can remember that one. It has about 16,000 articles on it. In fact, you can be connected to our website, sorry, uh, by, we have a, an email news that, that comes out every week or so, and we promise not to spam you or to sell your address to any third party. What it does is it tells you what's on the website. We often try to answer things that are in, are in the news. Uh, for instance, I wrote a big article when Roe v. Wade was repealed, which is a really good news uh, for the country <coughs> and for unborn babies. Uh, and also, they found the latest missing link. We all have an answer to that. But just remember, they found the missing link last year, the year before that, the year before that, right? <laughs> they want, want you to forget they don't believe those anymore. The missing links I learned in school, no one believes them anymore. But they hope that, they, that you don't remember that. But anyway, this is a, a, what we're going to do is, is pass around these um, sign-up sheets. All you need to do put, is put your name and put your email address, because there's an email newsletter. We promise not to spam you. We promise not to give or sell your address to any third party. We will protect your privacy. And put your postcode in, because that will actually tell you any creation speakers in the area. So you want to pass around, guys? Thanks for your patience waiting. I appreciate you waiting uh, uh, for that. So thanks again, guys. So name and address and postcode. And just to mention some of the books we have there, here is my, the commentary I wrote on Genesis 1 to 11. And what this does is try to show you how, what Genesis means and how it's important for all Christian doctrine. It has, has its beginnings in the early chapters of Genesis. Um, the only commentary in the world that talks about dinosaurs, okay, you won't find that in other, other places, and things like design, as well as how did Jesus and the New Testament understand Genesis. So it's a pretty important thing what Jesus believed about something. If we're Christians, we should believe what Jesus believed, I would have thought. Um, this is a video series about, based on, based on that commentary, if you're interested in going through as a Sunday school group, this 12-part series. Now, I, I'm going to ask you a question, if you don't mind. Um, can you answer this one? What was Jesus' first miraculous act recorded in the Gospels? Can you answer that? Everyone says that. I don't think it's right, though. Um, See, the war into wine, John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana, it was said to be the first sign to his disciples during his earthly ministry. See how it's qualified. But go back a chapter. What do we see? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And so who is the Word here? And it tells you, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So you see, even before he was born, he created everything. Isn't this the first miracle in the Gospels then? And it's pretty important because John wrote his Gospels so people would have uh, eternal life, but he starts off saying that Jesus is God and creator. So I think it's important for John, it should be important for us. And also God spoke through various prophets in the Old Testament. I think you Americans say Isaiah, Australia they say Isaiah. And they're both wrong because in Hebrew it's Yeshayahu. Okay. <laughs> So God spoke through Yeshayahu and said, I am the, the, the there's the one God, uh, one mediator between God and man, the man, sorry, this is this one here. Uh, I am the Lord and apart from me there is no saviour. So you see the logic here, if Jesus is saviour, he must be God. There's no way around that. He must be God to be saviour. But he's also fully man because he's the mediator between God and man. So he's both fully God and fully man. And the same prophet prophesied this one. He said, the Redeemer will come to Zion to those him." Jacob who repented of their sins. Now the Hebrew Goel actually means kinsman, redeemer. 
And it's translated that way in other parts of the Bible, the book of Ruth. And one qualification for the kinsman redeemer is that he must be related by blood to those whom he redeems. So if Jesus is our kinsman redeemer, he must be our blood relative somehow. Well, how can this be? Well, let's look at the Gospels. Two of the Gospels give his ancestry, the genealogies. Matthew's Gospel... <clears throat> Written to Jews, starts from the first Jew, Abraham, through to King David, through to uh, the lines of this blue line here of kings here, to Joseph. And notice the dotted line, because Joseph wasn't the biological father, because Jesus was born of a virgin. So Luke takes care of the biological side. The, Matthew's gospel tra traces the legal adopted side. Luke takes care of the biological side because he's actually tracing Mary's line. You can tell from the Greek it's Mary's line, and that's why the names are different. So Luke goes backwards from Mary, traces him to a son of David called Nathan. So J Joseph and Mary both come from King David through different sons, and David and then Abraham. But Abraham didn't drop out of the sky in Genesis 12. He had human ancestors. Where do you find those? You find those in Genesis 11 and Genesis 5. And Luke quotes those names as real historical people. See, Abraham was son of Terah, son of Nahor, etc. Son of Noah. And all the way back up to Adam, who is called the son of God, not the son of an ape. So you can't mix evolution and the Gospels. The Gospels are very clear. Adam is a direct creation of God. He is the ancestor of Jesus. He's the ancestor of everyone else on earth who's ever lived. No matter what race or people group you come from, you come from Adam. And therefore, you can be saved through Jesus, your kinsman redeemer. Throw out a historical Adam, you throw out the whole kinsman redeemer idea. And why send missionaries overseas unless those guys also came from Adam and need to know about their kinsman and redeemer? So it's not a side issue. And also Jesus said a few things. He said, Scripture cannot be broken. Now, is Genesis part of Scripture? Last time I checked, it was. Okay, so he's saying Genesis can't be broken. And how often he would say, it is written, he would quote Scripture. And for Jesus, what Scripture said is what God said. He rebuked the Sadducees saying, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? See, what you read in the Bible is what God is speaking to us. And you know what the word Bible stands for is basic instructions before leaving earth. And the thing is, the Bible is a history book. In fact, you've got theology and you've got morality, but both of those depend on the history of the Bible, the true history of the world. For instance, marriage is under attack in these days, right? Severe attack. But when Jesus was asked about marriage, he said, from the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. And what's he quoting here? You know, he's quoting from the very first two chapters of Genesis here. And he's quoting them as real history, as the basis for marriage. I mean, there are some who claim that Jesus said nothing about gay marriage. You find those in liberal theological cemeteries, I mean seminaries. Um, but clearly, here he's defining marriage as one male and one female. That's the only type of marriage Jesus recognized. And notice two become one flesh, not more than two. So it's one man and one wife, not one man and four wives. A man leaves his father and mother because the first man, Adam, had no father and mother. The two become one flesh because Eve was taken from Adam's flesh. So when you have the history, then all the morality makes perfect sense. Abandon the history, then the morality hasn't got a leg to stand on. And just a bit of science for you is that the rib is the one bone in the body that will grow back. So God knew what he was doing when he took the rib out because Adam didn't have to spend his whole life with a missing bone. And that was discovered late 20th century, that ribs will grow, regrow. But it looks like the Bible had it right all along. Now, what about the gospel itself? When people tell me, well, don't worry about Genesis, just preach the gospel. Okay, then, let's follow the example of the greatest gospel preacher in history. I don't mean Billy Graham, I mean the Apostle Paul, fair enough. How did Paul preach the gospel? Well, here's how he did it. The earliest Christian creed on record, 1 Corinthians 15, this great gospel and resurrection chapter in the New Testament. 
and um, reminds them of the gospel by which you are being saved that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, he raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. See, why in accordance with the scriptures? Because the gospel doesn't stand uh, dangle in a vacuum. It depends on the history revealed by the rest of the Bible. You see, gospel means good news, but you can't understand good news unless you know there's bad news. See, why do we need a savior? It's because we're sinners. And Paul goes to the scriptures to explain where sin entered the human race and the consequence of it. So where does he go? You know, he goes to Genesis 3. For as by a man came death by a man, has come all to the resurrection of the dead. For as an animal died, so in Christ shall all be made alive. So he's going to Genesis 3 and mentioning Adam by name as the one through whom sin entered the human race. And the consequence was death. God warned Adam, you were made from dust, now you're going to return to dust. That is clearly physical death there. And that's why Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, took on human nature so he could have a perfect human life and then go on the cross and pay the penalty we deserved. And our sins were nailed to him on that cross because right at the end he said, it is finished, which in Greek is one word, tetelestai, and that was written on bills of debt to say paid in full. So he's saying that our sin debt is paid in full when we believe on him because it's all nailed to that cross. But of course, that wasn't the end of it because on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. He appeared to 500 people at once. He appeared, he, the tomb was empty. No one could doubt that. He ate fish after his resurrection to show it's a physical, bodily resurrection. And Christianity would have been dead on arrival. If they could have found the body of Jesus, that's the end of Christianity. They never could, of course. All they could do is make up silly stories like you see in Matthew's gospel. Uh, just tell everyone that when you were asleep, the disciples came and sold the body. Well, that's silly because if you were asleep, how could you know that? Okay, it makes no sense. They had no answer. So, so Paul's gospel and resurrection chapter goes back to Adam. But also he goes to Genesis 2. He talks about, he basically quotes Genesis 2 here. The first man, Adam, became a living being. Again, Adam is the first man. He's not one of a whole lot of humans evolving from ape-like creatures. He's the first man explicitly here. And Jesus is called the last Adam. And the first man had to be given life. The last Adam comes from heaven to give life. So I must ask, which Adam is not important for the gospel? Clearly, Paul believes both of them are. And the point is, Adam's sin brought death, which is physical death, and Jesus' resurrection was physical as well. You see, uh, physical death on the cross, physical resurrection with the body, with the tomb empty, and that goes to show that Adam's death must have also included the physical aspect of it. And Genesis is where you find the first prophecy of the Messiah. God is pronouncing doom on the evil serpent, Satan, and saying that her offspring, this offspring of the woman would be the one to destroy the serpent. And this is a prophecy of the virginal conception. Jesus is the seed of the woman because he has no human father. So you see how all the doctrines of Christianity had their beginning in these early chapters of Genesis. Now I use the term virginal conception just to remind people that the miracle was the conception. The birth might have been a normal birth. It seems to be a normal birth, but the conception was miraculous. And to remind us of the biblical and scientific fact that life begins at fertilization. This is a scientific fact. The Bible also teaches that scientific fact. And the first to rejoice at the coming of Christ was another unborn baby, John the Baptist, that six months gestation was the first to rejoice at Jesus' coming. And this goes into, I've gone and led into another question of why there's death and suffering in a world created by a God of love. Well, I hope I've answered the question already. It wasn't the way man, God originally made it. Death is an intruder because of sin. Adam's sin is what brought death into the world. Now, evolution tells you it was death that brought man into the world. See, these pictures are diametrically opposed to each other. You can't mix them consistently. Now, I'm not saying you're not a Christian if you believe in evolution. We don't say that. We're saying there's a huge logical disconnect. 
trying to mix the two. And since Jesus in John 1 is called the Logos, that's the Greek word, in the beginning was the words, in the beginning was the Logos, and that's where we get the word logic from. So being a Christian, we should be logical in our faith and not hold to logical contradictions like death being the way that man arose, and yet the Bible's quite clear that death is the result of man's sin. Now, the founding chairman of Creation Ministries was a Christian evolutionist for decades, but he realized eventually he had to, he could not mix these two pictures, and he repented of this picture. He said, he's going to trust God's word on this picture. And this even gets to the idea of, of the time frame, why it's a big deal. I'm going to show you why the, why the long time frame is a problem. And, and I'm going back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve here, and God said everything here was very good. That's a pretty emphatic statement, especially in Genesis 1, God calls it good seven times, and seven's a number of perfection. The seventh time is very good. He's telling us there's no death or suffering or evil in the finished creation. But see, millions of years, though, that came about around 200 years ago, where certain people decided they didn't want to trust the Bible as a true record of history. They said that we must explain rock layers by things we see happening today. There's no, there's no global flood happening today, so we rule that out by decree that it can't be the cause of the rock layers. So things are going slowly and gradually today, so it takes millions of years to build up these rock layers. That's where the millions of years came from. This assumption of slow and gradual changes. The problem is, though, is if Adam and Eve were created over after the millions of years, these, they're, on, they're on these rock layers that took millions of years to form, but the rock layers contain fossils, and fossils are remains of dead things. You can't escape that. Fossils are remains of dead things. And the fossils show evidence of disease like gout and osteoporosis and bone cancer which means there's suffering in the fossil record of both humans and animals. And then somehow God says, all this is very good. So God is saying bone cancer is very good. I don't know what you call very bad. Bone cancer is good. But this is the logical outcome of trying to mix millions of years with the Bible, is you're going to put death and suffering and disease before sin. And how much of the Bible do we have to chop out to make that work. I mean, um, the goodness of God gets chopped out because God said everything here is very good. Death is called the last enemy. But millions of years of dead things happen before sin. How is it the last enemy? We see Romans 5. Sin came into the world through one man, death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, uh, Romans 5 contrasts two heads of humanity. You have Adam who brought sin and death and Jesus who brought righteousness and life. Uh, next chapter, we see the contrast condensed into one verse. The wage of the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, over and over again, we are seeing this picture that death is the result of sin. So how much of the Bible are they going to chop out to make it agree with the evolution or long ages? It's a problem. Big problem there. I've shown you mostly New Testament passages. And the thing is, that it, it's millions of years means that death is no longer related to sin. And therefore, ask, how could Jesus' death pay for our sin? Now, this is the wrong way around, because the Bible's God's word. That should trump everything. I mean, some have rebuked me and told me the Bible's not a scientific textbook, and I usually respond, well, thank goodness, because textbooks always go out of date. So the question is then, uh, what changes were made? Well, I mean, I think one, one change which is quite um, blatant is the change of diet. So humans and animals were created to be vegetarian. Now, after the flood, we were allowed to eat meat. You see what God says, I gave you green plants, now I'm giving you them animals to eat. So it's not a sin to eat meat, we know that, because Jesus ate the Passover lamb. He ate fish after his resurrection. Jesus was sinless, so therefore it's not sinful to eat meat, okay? But it wasn't the original diet. And also, back then, animals weren't hurting each other, but now we live in a fallen world, and my home country is proof of the, that we live in a fallen world. I'll show you.
Yeah, so we live in a fallen world, okay? That's the main thing I'm trying to tell you here. Um, but fortunately, this is not the end. God wins, okay? God is always going to win. And there's a promise of restoration, redemption, all these sort of re-words uh, that imply a perfect condition that has been lost. You see the idea? What does restore mean? It means going back to what you had originally. So if millions of years of death and suffering are in our past, Restoration means going back to millions of years of death and suffering. Oh, not really much to look forward to. And the Bible is very clear that uh, we do have something to look forward to. There will be no more tears or death or pain, sorrow, because those things are the result of the curse, and the curse will be abolished. And the tree of life will once again exist. What does this remind you of? It reminds you of Eden before sin. See how the Bible right at the end goes full circle back to Eden, just reminding us that God created everything very good. In fact, the new heavens and new earth will be better than Eden because we won't be able to sin. There'll be no more possibility of sinning in the new heavens and new earth. But you see how you can't understand the reading of the Bible unless you know the first 11 chapters. And the New Testament authors expected you to know Genesis. So the question is then, how did fossils form after Adam's sin? What could have caused that? Well, I think the Bible has three whole chapters explaining that. See, Jesus affirmed the flood was real, Noah is real, and the ark is real. He clearly believed it. And when you go to Genesis, you look at this pile-up of universal language here. All the high mountains under the whole heaven and all flesh died, all mankind Everything on the dry land, and only Noah was left. Okay, so this is quite clearly a globe-covering flood here. I mean, a local flood that covered just the Middle East and Iraq or whatever makes no sense. Why do you build an ocean liner-sized arc longer than a football field if it's just a local flood? Just migrate like Lot did from Sodom. And what about the promise that Rainbow promised is a promise never to do the same thing, do this again. So what did God promise never to do? Well, here's a, a little clip for you, a cartoon. Uh, the Rainbow reminds that God will never destroy the earth in a, in a flood. And one oh, of my Christian culture professors said the flood was just confined to the Middle East. Uh, so God will never send another local flood? Of course, I believe God keeps his promises, and God has promised not to do another global flood. God has kept that promise. God never breaks promises. So let's contrast the biblical view with the secular view of fossil formation. This comes from an Australian high school biology book around my vintage. How does a fossil form? Well, okay, left panel, fish is swimming, and then it dies and sinks to the bottom. You see on the top panel, the mountains get eroded away over millions of years and wash silt into the ocean and bury that fish slowly over millions of years to form the fossil. And the right panel, uh, same sort of thing, and look how worn away the land is. So this is millions of years to take to form a fossil. That's what they tell you. That's what the museums tell you, the textbooks tell you. But let's do some real science, you know, observation, testing. Repeating. Some of you keep fish, don't you? You have pet fish. When you lose one, where do you find the dead one? Where do you find it? Floating on the top, right? You know this, you see? You don't, have, don't have to be a PhD scientist or a few evolutionists. Simple things like this. That dead fish float when they die. They don't sink. We know this picture makes no sense. This is what happens. And what happens to the floating dead fish? I mean, you know what happens if you don't bury, get, take the fish out. It's going to rot away and fall apart and the scavengers will get to it and there'll be nothing left. I mean, have you been scuba diving and found uh, the ocean floor filled with fossilizing dead fish? Have you ever seen fossil roadkill? No, this is not the right way, is it? So here's a better way. You have the fishy swimming, but this time you have the flood erupting and the fountains of the great deep 
uh, with the first call. Before the rainfall, you have these underwater eruptions. The fountain of the great deep, so you've got these huge underwater mudslides, and the poor fish hasn't got a chance to escape, and it's buried very deeply, okay? So now the scavengers can't get to it. The soft parts might run away, but the mud is full of minerals that turn the bone into stone. But the thing is, it has to be buried quite deeply with mineral-rich mud. And if you do that, fossils gonna, it will form in a, in a day or so. It doesn't take millions of years to do, to do that. And when you look at some of the fossils around, I think you'll see why they must be very quickly formed. Like this is an ichthyosaur, a reptile version of a dolphin, and she's giving birth here. It's a baby. Was this poor thing living, giving birth over millions of years while slowly being buried? I mean, I've heard of long, difficult labor, but really. <laughs> and what about you guys who own fish? When you feed them, do they eat quickly or slowly? Quick or slow? Quick, I think you're right. So what do you think of this picture here? In the middle of his lunch, right? I mean, imagine you go to your cholesterol, go to McDonald's, get your cholesterol burger, chomp, and you fossilize like this. You see how quickly this would have happened. You see, it couldn't be slow. It had to be quick to get something like that. And we have all the sorts of fossils that really show they had to be buried quickly, like these fighting dinosaurs from Mongolia. Buried in the middle of a fight here. This is what they're doing, and they're actually buried in this position. No time to escape. They were buried extremely deeply, in that fighting pose. And speaking of dinosaurs, some dinosaur bones still have soft, oops, sorry, still have some soft tissue in them. And I let the discoverer explain the situation. Dr. Mary Schweitz is on 60 Minutes explaining why this is really quite a bombshell. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast, and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissues. This is the piece. No. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur. Yeah. Without mineral now, that's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You I see, didn't you want say, to tell anybody. <laughs> that you'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, okay, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that look suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like shocked. I mean, how could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones look at that blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science that organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. See, what an admission there. The rules of science say it can't even be a million years old, but they want to have their faith, their blind faith, that it's 68 million years old despite the science. I think I'm going to trust the science on this, not their religious belief. And let's look at one more thing. A lot of the things, I've got a whole talk just on the flood evidences. In fact, I'm doing a whole talk on dinosaurs to the chapel, um, to the kids at the chapel tomorrow as well. So have got a few different specialists talk to you. But here's one interesting thing you might, be, might like. Um, and this is how quickly certain things can form that people don't seem to realize how quickly they form. Uh, like, for instance, canyons, like the Grand Canyon. One myth is that it takes millions of years to form. But you might recall about 40 years ago, you have the eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. And one result was carving this canyon, the little Grand Canyon. It's still over 100 feet deep. How long did it take? Did it take millions of years to carve this? Actually, it took only a single afternoon. 
You know, lots of water over, doesn't need lots of time. And in fact, in many physical processes, you can trade intensity for time. So if you have something as intense as a global flood, you don't need lots of time. And if you haven't got lots of time, evolution is impossible. Now, I'm not saying evolution is possible even with, with lots of time, but it's certainly not possible with, with a short time period. And here's another canyon from that. This took two and a half years to form. And what we have here is a river going through, but here the river did not cause the canyon. The canyon caused the river. And we find this sort of thing across in the, throughout the world. The river is much smaller than the valley it's in, which points to a much larger amount of water covering, carving out the valley and the river following the path already carved out for it. Even the, the Grand Canyon, you can, very, you can stand on the rim and it's quite hard to see the small Colorado River down below. So again, the Colorado River couldn't have carved that Grand Canyon. For one thing, it would have had to fly uphill to do it, and I don't see rivers going uphill very often. So here's an example of how uh, we see so much evidence that things happen much more quickly than people think. And that's if you understand the, fl the flood was global, you, don't, you have a much better handle of biblical history. Now, going back to why I come to churches to defend Genesis, well, Jesus, in fact, said, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? See, if we, as a, the wider church body, don't trust the Bible on earthly things like creation in six ordinary days and a global flood, why would we trust it on the heavenly things that Jesus is our Lord and Savior? And yet we're supposed to be prepared to make a defense or an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that he had. But Christianity is not a blind faith. In fact, Jesus told us, to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind. There's nothing in the Bible that says you, you check in your brains at the church door. We're supposed to engage our mind. We're supposed to nourish it on God's word. But what happens, I mean, your, your kids uh, come home from school or Hollywood, Jurassic Park, or Jurassic World, whatever they, they do, they ask you these questions. Um, if God made everything, who made God? And, Dinosaurs died at 66 million years ago. How could the Bible be right? And doesn't carbon dating prove millions of years? And how do we get different races if we all came from Adam and Eve? And where did Cain get his wife when he wasn't able? <laughs> now, if you have trouble with these questions, you might like to, to try this book, the Creation Answers book, that has 60 questions and 20 chapters. And this is part of a pack here, um, which has my first book, Refuting Evolution, designed to, as an interactive book for, basically for high school students to answer the propaganda they have in their biology textbooks, and basically a free DVD here, so it's a real Jewish bargain. <laughs> if you want something a bit, bit more general about Christian apologetics, you might like this book, Christianity for Skeptics, and how do you answer Islam or New Age ideas or atheism. Why do we believe that God, the Bible is God's word and that Jesus rose from the dead? Those sort of things are answered here. But now I want to get on to this issue of design because design is one of my favorite uh, topics, okay? Again, I've got a whole book and a talk on design of things. But it's interesting, Richard Dawkins, you may have heard of him, a leading atheist who uses evolution to push his atheistic religion and he says that biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Now, he doesn't believe they were designed. I do. I think they looked that way because they were that way. And the Apostle Paul agrees. He said the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Even Dawkins and Darwin have no excuse. So let's think about how we detect design. Here's a simple thing for you. Aeroplane. It was designed, right? But how do you know it was designed? If you didn't see it being made, how would you know? Well, I think one thing you might look for is it has loads of correct components. But do you realize an aeroplane is made up totally of non-flying parts? I mean, does a wing fly? Does a cockpit fly? Does an engine fly? 
well, how do I get back to Australia then? Well, the answer is they must be organised correctly. So not only correct components, but also correct organisation. And when you have organisation, you know there's an organiser. See, what's the evolutionary alternative? Well, evolution basically says matter plus time plus energy produces organisation. So I'm going to test that. I'm going to use an air, uh, this scenario for making an aeroplane. I have a junkyard of aeroplane parts for the matter. I have a tornado for the energy and as much time as you want. And you're getting an aeroplane out of this. How realistic is that? Maybe not. Huh? Now, what if I told you instead, this is a picture of, an air, of the tornado hitting the aeroplane and turning it into a junkyard. Is that better? Yes. It is. So why do you think it is? What's the, uh, why is this better? Why do you think? Well, the principle is actually quite important to know. It's actually not too hard. The reason is there are many more ways of being a junkyard than being an aeroplane. That's all. So when you have time and energy, you go to the more probable state, the junkyard. I mean, parents, you know this. Do you have to tell your children to mess up their rooms? <laughs> because there are many more ways of being messy than being tidy. Very useful principle. Now let's compare that to living creatures. See, living creatures, by definition, make copies of themselves. Like your children are sort of copies of you. And your body has about a trillion, it's 30 trillion cells, and your cells keep on making copies of themselves. That's how your body grows and repairs, because you have these self-copying cells, which are microscopic, but far more complicated than anything we can make. See, the airplanes don't have, the jet plane doesn't have baby jets. And the Boeing factory makes new jet planes, but it doesn't make you a new factory. It's not self-copying, but every living thing is self-copying. So living things are far more complex than any man-made things, but the evolutionists want to say that living things got here by, by time, uh, energy, and, and what was the other one? Matter, right? And parts, components. Matter, time, energy, very important. So let's do another one here. I'm going to test this theory again with a frog in a blender. Now I turn the switch on and what happens? I add energy, right? And the results are frog smoothie. Now, if I left this going for millions of years, what would, could I get a, would a frog hop out of here if I left it long enough? Now again, once again, there are many more ways of being a smoothie than being a frog. And you realize, if I could can this and sterilize it, it could be safe to eat for many years. It doesn't have to be canned for its frogs. But how about canned Georgia peaches, canned Florida oranges? Canned sardine, anything you like. See, in canned food, you have all the components of life you could possibly want. All the machines, everything you want. But if it's sterile, sterilized and sealed, no living thing will ever grow in there and give you food poisoning. Because food poisoning is caused by germs, which are living creatures. Microscopic living creatures. But if it's sterilized and sealed, you're not going to get food poisoning. The only way you get food poisoning is if the seal got broken and it came in from outside. It won't come from inside. It had to come out from outside. See, real science says life comes only from life. Evolution says life came from non-living chemicals. Now, I've given you the optimal sort of chemicals for life in these cans of food, and I'll give you whatever energy you want and whatever time you want. Let's see if you can grow some living things in there. It's not going to happen. So every time you eat canned food, you should realize that evolution doesn't have a leg to stand on. Now I want to give you an example of why this is the, the, the case. Uh, one of the many things that we have is some quite complicated machines. So like one of them makes this stuff. So you, so you eat food for energy, but in the cell, the energy is this stuff here called ATP. So it looks like a complicated chemical. It probably is. Uh, but now uh, we, we know how that our body makes its own weight in this stuff every day and consumes it just about as fast as it makes it. 
Sinai kills you by stopping this from being made. So you see how important this stuff is. But now we know it's made by the tiniest motor in the universe. This animated sequence shows the ATP synthase enzyme in operation. The animation is based on an incredible series of scientific discoveries. Only the colors show artistic license. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency of the cell. ATP is produced by a tiny molecular rotary motor, rotating it up to 7,000 RPM. These are so small that 100,000 would fit side by side in a millimeter. A current of protons drives the motor, unlike man-made electric motors which use electrons. This portion of the enzyme is where adenosine diphosphate is combined with a phosphate ion in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP, which is then released, making way for the next cycle. A top view of the enzyme shows the sequential operation. Almost every biochemical process in your body requires ATP. Such a nanomachine exhibits all the characteristics of super-intelligent design. ATP is vital for life, and many of these motors were needed before the first living cell could exist. An evolutionary impossibility. So each of your trillions of cells has thousands of these motors whirring. If they weren't, you would be dead. So these are important motors. Now I want to get uh, back to this airplane example and show you what would really show design with this is finding the instruction manual to build it. See, so if we not just have the machinery and the organization, but also the instructions, that really shows design. And this is what we have with living things. We have not just the machines I've showed you, but the instructions to build them, the famous DNA molecule, which doesn't stand, which, which actually stands for definitely no accident, okay? Well, actually, deoxyribonucleic acid is what it stands for, but it's a message molecule of life. It has the instructions for all that make us who we are. And, it, it, and um, with lots of machines, it will copy those instructions to the next generation. So you didn't really get your mother's eyes or father's ears. You got the instructions from your, for your mother's eyes and father's ears. Copied to you when you began life as a fertilized egg. Now, these instructions also have to be read. I mean, even the simplest thing um, cell has about 600 kilobytes of highly compressed information. And why I say that is because to try to simulate what a living cell does when it divides, it took 100, over 100 compute, supercomputers running for nine to 10 hours uh, to generate about half a gigabyte of information. This is the supposedly simple cell. Now we humans have about 5,000 times as much. We have about three gigabytes of highly compressed information. Now, if the information in each of our cells was written in paper and ink, it would take a thousand Bible-sized books to write it. Mind you, only 100, um, 200 times the size of the IRS tax code. The thing is, the information uh, in the book is not from the ink. This is not how a book is written, right? So the information comes from outside the ink. It comes from the author who arranges the ink into letters and words and sentences and paragraphs. It didn't write itself. The information doesn't come from the molecules of the ink, but from outside the ink molecules. In exactly the same way, there's nothing in the chemistry of DNA that makes it write the message of life. Again, the information comes from outside. It's written on DNA, just like the message of a book is written with ink, but it doesn't come from the ink or the DNA. And it means that you have to have a language. See, my books won't matter to you if you don't read English. Now, for instance, if I gave you a gift, you'd be happy, right? See, gift means something for free, right? And a good thing, hopefully. Now, if you were Germans, would you like me to give you a gift? Well, gift in German means poison. I kid you not. In fact, a German uh, confirmed this after one of my talks in New Zealand, and he said when he first came to New Zealand, he was appalled by our Christmas custom because we try to poison our families. 
So you see why, why you need the right language. Otherwise, you get the wrong message. But in fact, DNA is actually much better than a human language because there's multiple languages on the same part of a DNA. See, if one language shows at least human intelligence, what does multiple languages show but intelligence far advanced, far beyond our own? Like a book you can read in English and German and backwards and every tenth letter and the same letters are uh, multiple languages simultaneously. And just the thing is, the languages have to be decoded. And this requires lots of machines. I'll show you some of the machines uh, reading one of the languages involved. This animation demonstrates how the digital information encoded within DNA is used to direct protein synthesis. This is a DNA double helix containing the digital code which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. And here we see a protein complex called an RNA polymerase traveling down the DNA strand. As it moves down the strand, it carefully unwinds the DNA, preparing it for transcription. Inside the polymerase, we see a single-stranded copy of the original instructions being assembled as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. A stop code marks the end of the protein specification, at which point this copy, known as a messenger RNA transcript, exits the polymerase and heads towards a two-part chemical manufacturing machine called the ribosome. While the messenger RNA moves towards the ribosome, transfer RNA molecules attach to specific amino acids in preparation for assembly. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome, the process of translation begins. Using the instructions encoded on the messenger RNA as a template, the transfer RNA molecules align specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids, creating a protein chain. As this chain exits the ribosome, it is met by chaperones which prevent premature folding while escorting the protein to a barrel-shaped machine called a chaperonin. This machine helps fold the protein into the precise shape required to perform its function. Although it is unclear how the chaperonin achieves this, we do know that accurate folding is essential in order for the protein to accomplish its intended function. Once the protein is complete, it is released into the cytoplasm to do its job. So this is sort of a simplified version of what every living thing has to do. It has to have these machines to decode the instructions. And one paradox is, uh, for the evolutionists is that the instructions for decoding machines are on the DNA, but you can't read those instructions unless you already have the decoding machines. And it must be basically p almost perfect from the start. So even if it was, what, say, 1% off, 99% right, uh, that 1% would actually make worse decoding machines, make errors in the decoding machines, which would do a worse job of, of decoding, then the next generation would be even worse. It would cr crash to a halt really quickly. And this again points to the biblical account that God created everything very good. And the science shows that it had to start very good. And what we're seeing is going downhill. It could not have started anything less than very good and worked its way up because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be alive unless it was basically perfect. That's actually a good time to, to um, close off the main thing. Just want to show, just ask you about the information is a key issue for evolution. In fact, Richard Dawkins, a famous atheistic evolutionist, even uh, was asked about where does the information come from? Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Even the world champion evolutionist couldn't answer that question. He's also said evolution has been observed. It's just that it hasn't been observed while it's happening. <laughs> and this actually helps him to... to he, he's pretty good at helping us do what we do because he actually said um, evolution... Oh, sorry. 
Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. You see, he needs evolution as a crutch for his atheistic religion. And what are we supposed to do about it? Sorry. We're supposed to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You see, we're not just about bashing evolution or showing there's an amazing design out there. We want to point people back to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the aim of our ministry. And since Jesus is called the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, I wanted to start my talk with Jesus and end my talk with Jesus. That's what our ministry is about. Just to explain what we can do to help um, share the truth about Jesus Christ, our Creator and Savior, one of the best things we have is our creation magazine. It's been the best witnessing tool we have. And here's a, a case of someone who had left the faith of his parents. But in fact, some faithful creation of people are witnessing to him using creation magazines as a witnessing tool. He realized that evolution hasn't got a leg to stand on. A creation must be true, uh, and if there's a creator, I must be accountable to him. So how can I become right with my creator? Well, every magazine presents the gospel. And here's a, a case from a, a, a young mother who realizes this is a tool that she can help for her own faith, but also to witness to her children, teach her children as witness and, and witness to her friends. Because let's make it very clear, someone is witnessing to your children. It's not a case of do we witness, but who is doing the witnessing. And that's why we would like to make it very right for us to do the right sort of witnessing. And this is why we have a chance to subscribe today. So what's going to happen, uh, I'll give a signal to hand these out. Some clipboards are going to come around. And what I ask you to do is got these forms on there. Now, would you please uh, put a one-year or two-year subscription? Now, two-year is a, is a bulk discount. But there's also other benefits to it as well. Now, please put your name and your... Uh, not yet, not yet, not yet, please, not, please, I've got to explain, please, can you stop, please, stop, 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 I've got to explain what to do first, um, otherwise you know, I won't know what to do when I've got it, that's all, um, put your name and your address so we can know who to send it to, and a postcode, all that. and also put your email address, because it comes with a free email subscription, it's pretty good to have that, because this email a subscription can be handed to up to five different devices around the world, you've got family or friends, all in different countries around the world, we can give you the code, and they can download it on their own, have the, have the paper one for yourself, and give a digital one to your friends or your family members. And please don't go away with it. After you fill it out, please give it to the nice people who've been helping me at the book table. It'd be very helpful um, and receive some gifts. And these are English gifts, not German gifts, okay? Okay, now if you pay for one year, we, 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 actually I've not got the first issue with me. We do get the free digital one. We will give you the first issue. As soon as I process at the office, uh, the, the, your first issue will come really quickly. As soon as this gets processed, which is not going to be far away. And if you pay for two years, you get these two additional DVDs. One of them is a, a documentary on the Darwin, on Darwin's life. We did that for the Darwin Bicentennial in uh, 2009, basically showing all the locations he visited, his house, and what made him tick. And the four, remember that uh, clip I showed you right at the beginning? Well, I've got the full video here. So go ahead and pass. Thanks for your patience, guys. I appreciate your uh, helping me out like this. Uh, it's really, I couldn't do this without you guys helping at the book table, the ushering, um, helping me set up. I just couldn't do what I do without such good help from the church here. And uh, it's a quarterly magazine, and, and other months you're going to get some nice, nice things as well. You've got some uh, nice uh, newsletter that come with all sorts of good information there. And just to show you what sort of things are in there, it's really good to, for your kids as well. Here's an article, a classic article, How Do Dating Methods Work? And this is not about how boys make girl, uh, meet girls, it's about how old things are and how we know. And here's an example of how things can form really quickly, like these, there's a fountain in Yorkshire in northern England that's actually so mineral rich that it turns things into stone. And just another thing, here's an interesting uh, idea, how do you get different races from Adam and Eve? Well, these two girls are twins. See, the, the parents are bi, uh, both biracial. The parents are both biracial. So this is like what Adam and Eve would have done. Adam and Eve's family could have had a very wide range of skin shades, 
because I think God programmed with a lot of genetic diversity, and you see this sort of thing happening even now. Now, what about carbon dating? Well, carbon-14 is very unstable. After about 100,000 years, there should be nothing left. So yet it's found in things like diamonds, like coal and diamond. Diamond is a type of carbon, you know. You know your pencil lead is... Not lead, okay, it's graphite, a type of carbon. You can't get lead poisoning from chewing your pencils. I don't recommend it, but you can't get the po lead poisoning from it, okay? Now, diamond is the hardest, is also a form of carbon, is the hardest substance on Earth except for the human heart. And it's supposed to be billions of years old, and yet carbon-14 is found in each of them which means they can't have existed long enough, otherwise the carbon-14 would have decayed if they'd been around for even 100,000 years. They could be less than 100,000 years, they could not be more than that. That's the issue there. Uh, that's one of the articles. And every magazine has kids' pages, four pages for the kids. I'm actually doing a series on the flood for kids. And last time we did a series, before that, I was doing one on astronomy for kids. So some quite, hopefully uh, something in, the, in this for everyone. Just a few of the other things while, while these um, clips are going around. Uh, just a lot of things for kids here. We have this pack for the kids here. So it's uh, good for Christmas and birthday. For fairly young kids, I think it's a discounted pack, hardcover, full colour. This is also a nice one for very, nice, very young kids. It's, if you're a nana, you can go through this with your young grandkids. And they even have notes to explain what, we're, what you're teaching them. Nano notes for the, for the benefits of what you're doing. Um, dinosaurs. They'll be talking about this tomorrow. But here's a, a book on dinosaurs for uh, basically middle school. There's even some books for younger kids on dinosaurs on the table there. Uh, but for older, for, for, for high school and adults, I think dinosaurs are something everyone should know about. I think parents should know more about any topic than their kids. That's my opinion, anyway. Okay, uh, and this is a one way you can be uh, you can keep up with your kids on dinosaur knowledge. It's a, quite an interesting book, hopefully. Uh, all sorts of different pictures. We we try and make them very attractive for people. And here's something: if you want to know more about the flood, this biblical geology 101 is a very good one. But don't forget the other ones I mentioned before. The Creation Answers book is very helpful as a as a good way of starting off creation knowledge. Well, thank you very much for. For listening to me, I appreciate all the help I've had at this uh, at this church, and so thank you very much. I'll pass on to the boss now. I'll black the screen too. There you go.